Okay, so with this, we're going to look at some of the tools that we didn't cover last class that we can work with in Photoshop. So when you get this open, I can use this wonderful tool called the Healing Brush, which we'll look at very shortly. But before that, I'm going to show you uh, why when you're working on a photograph, you don't want to just use, say, the paintbrush. Because when I look at this picture and decide, okay, if I want to paint some skin, like to cover up what we see on screen here, and I can make my brush bigger or smaller using the square bracket keys. But if I want to paint on the skin, it's like, well, what color is that? Now, the eyedropper tool, I can click and choose. And if I move around, I find that I keep getting all these different colors. So what color is the skin? And the answer is it's a whole bunch of colors because if we zoom way in, we'll see that there's a lot of variety of colors occurring here. It's not just simply, oh, I can just choose a fleshy tone and paint with it. So I can sample a color, switch back to my paintbrush, and start painting. And the problem with doing that is the area that I've painted has no texture to it. It's now flat color. And it's generally going to show up in a printed material like a blob of color on a photograph. And it looks like crap. So I would discourage you from using that as a method for doing it. So I will undo that. So the paintbrush, while I could try to very carefully cover an area, it's not going to work really well. Clone stamp used to be our old standby. So I hold down the option key. And I can choose an area that I want to copy, like right here. Now I'll shrink down my brush a little bit. And so I choose this area right here, hold down Option and click. The first time you click on the clone stamp during a session of Photoshop, if you do not Option click to define your source area, the area you're trying to clone, and then you try to paint with the clone stamp, it will give you an error message or a warning and say, the source area has not been defined. Please Option or Alt click to define your source point. You're like, oh yeah, sorry, I forgot. So now we can see that there's a crosshairs from that's showing what it's copying, and then we can see where it's copying, and it's copying actual pixels. So I can option click and define that pink up there, get rid of some of the bruising here, and then I could continue on, and if we zoom out, we can see that it starts to cover up my stupidity of my firewood cutting incident. But it still isn't great. I'm not really fond of that, so I'm going to undo that, get it back to it. So clone stamp is cool, and we'll revisit that again shortly, but when I'm doing repairs like this, the tool of choice when you're cleaning up and working on a photograph is going to be your healing brush, and I can use that to heal an area, and what it does is it works kind of like the clone stamp where it samples the areas nearby, and it starts to look for, well, what was there, what is there, and gives you, I really need to kind of desaturate it under the eye here because it has a little bit of bruising. So there is even um, here, under the sponge tool, my sponge is set to desaturate. Go to a little smaller brush. and I can get rid of some of that purple occurring there. Now that I've co corrected my damage on the eye, I'm going to go back to the clone stamp tool because it can do some interesting creative things. Because I can now define a source point, say my eyeball here, and then I can go and start painting an eyeball up onto my forehead. <laughs> because, well, I mean, the truth of the matter is, I'm, you know, this is just showing you what's already there because I can read your thoughts and know what's going on while you're sitting in the classroom here without having to spy on your computer, I know what you're thinking. And this picture is now revealing that. Or I can just make it even extra creepy and we can start putting extra eyes you know, down the cheek here and then redefine it again. So we can have all kinds of creepiness going on. So we can make our own version of a horror movie and have quite a bit of fun with it. So the clone stamp tool is a really nice option that you can explore and do some interesting things with. Now I'm going to switch over to a different photograph here. And on this particular photograph I'm going to show you another tool that's built into Photoshop that gives you some options 
of working and it's called liquify. If I go under filter and choose liquify, I can have a lot of fun because the base concept in liquify is I have now turned my entire picture into silly putty and I can just push and pull it as I see fit. Now that's not very attractive or well thought out so I'm going to go back and do it properly. If you make a mock of it, there is a reconstruct brush or a thaw where you can restore it all. You can click restore all, it brings it back. Now what I'm going to work with is I'm going to first start out with the bloat tool. The bloat tool makes things a little bit fatter. The advantage of using liquify is it's working with the pixels of the artwork itself. So let's say I want to look like I, you know, stepped out of an anime feature. Now you could do with this, and this is where it's kind of fun. We're going to look at this a little bit. Um, oh wait, I, I need to cancel all of this. Before I do this, I want to have it before or after. So I'm duplicating my layer. I'm going to repeat that process, throw this away. To duplicate a layer, I take the layer in the layer palette, I drag it to the new layer icon, and that creates a duplicate of the layer. There's a keyboard shortcut, and I can right click on layers, and I can go to the layer pull down menu to all perform the same operation. In Photoshop, there's usually four to six methods to do the identical process. But now I've created a copy of this background layer to work on. Now I'll go back to liquify. I'm going to have a little bit of fun. Now, if you have pictures of friends and family on Facebook, what you could do is you could have a little bit of fun here. Now, I've just done some real subtle alterations. And if we look at this and compare, so it still looks like a picture, but if we see before, after, before, after, now just think on Facebook, you take a picture of your friend or your sibling and you have a little bit of fun with them, do some real subtle changes and post that on Facebook. Make sure to tag them so it distributes to everyone's network of friends. And then they look at it and they start freaking out about, do I really look like that? Is that really how I look? And if done subtly, Liquify can create some really frightening images that are utterly convincing. But if you're going to work in the non-subtle manner, which we'll look at here, you can also have a lot of fun. Oh, I don't want to shrink that. I want to keep growing the eyes because, you know, it's fun to be an anime character. So I like having those big, scary eyes. And if I decide that Michael Jackson is my idol, and I feel bad picking on him now, though, because, you know, he did, you know, pass away. But I can seriously uh, reduce the scale of my nose, give it a nice sharp point to it, and I can work my lips a little bit, decide that I don't need Angelina Jolie lips, I can shrink that down. But if I want to be a little bit more like Jay Leno, I can start to uh, beef out my chin a little bit here so I get that real manly jawline occurring. So I can do some really fun things. And then I can even go through and if I lower my brush size enough, I can even start to decide that, well, they're going to be doing World of Warcraft at this anime convention, so if I'm going to go there, I really should have, you know, those kind of elfin ears that are so part of all the World of Warcraft characters, so I can pull that out. And after I've completed that, I can say, wow, you know, so before, after. But I'm painting with the picture, so it's a lot of fun. So you use Second Photoshop Episode 5. He did some fun things. He introduced two techniques that I want to demonstrate. Now I went and found some fire to play with, and it looks like this. It's an image on a black background. The advantage of the black background is I can now take advantage of layer blending modes. Layer blending modes allow me to control how one layer mixes with the next layer. So I can choose multiply, it combines things together, and I could choose difference, which is kind of fun here. So you can see how we get some really interesting things going on with that one. I'm, I'm digging it, but it's not the end result I want. And I can choose things like screen, which now makes the black in the picture disappear. So by having an image with a black background, you choose screen, the image stays, the background disappears, and now it layers perfectly with your objects below. It's a very cool way of creating this blend. So now it looks like I'm trapped in this fiery inferno. Something else that he did is he introduced what's called an adjustment layer. 
Now, when I look at my image here, up the face, I used to go under image, I would choose adjustments, and I could do these different changes to it. These are destructive pixel editing changes. I make this change, it takes effect. That's it. I can't do anything to it afterward. So if I choose something like levels, levels is nice because now I can make my darks darker. I can lighten or darken my midtones. I can make my lights lighter, effectively compressing the dynamic range in my image. This histogram up here shows the concentration of darks, grays, and lights. So I can now adjust my image to add to the drama or excitement of what's occurring. But if I do that, it takes effect permanently and I have no recourse for adjustment. Not good when we have better options. So everything under image adjust, I have access to as an adjustment layer down here. Well, almost everything. So if I choose levels down here, I can make that same change in levels. But I can turn it on and off. I can decide if I want it or not. A lot of flexibility. Levels are a really easy way to clean up your artwork, especially if you take bad photographs. Curves are levels on steroids, so they do a very similar thing, but you can tweak it a little bit so you don't have to necessarily do it in a linear manner and you can get some really fun things starting to occur when you start inverting different color settings. Ooh, I'm liking that. It's kind of, that's actually really kind of fun. So I'm going to leave that one for now, but turn it off and maybe come back to it. But it's fun. And if I pull it above the fire, turn the fire back on, now it works with the fire as well. And I'm really starting to dig that one. That's kind of fun. But what happened in You Suck at Photoshop is he brought in a nuke on a black background, much like my fire. And then he added in a hue saturation adjustment layer. That allows you to, overall, I can adjust all of my saturation. I can make it lighter, darker. I can adjust so I'm effectively shifting colors. So yellow becomes green, red becomes yellow, green becomes blue, blue becomes purple, purple becomes red. And you can do an adjustment. You can see in the color sliders at the bottom the offset that's occurring with that. So you can see how the colors are shifting based on pulling this. But what he did is he hit colorize, bump the saturation way up, and then I'm not, I think he went for kind of orangish red here to make it get a little bit darker. So we can see it's affecting everything, but if I put the fire above it, then I can have the red background, the fire burning. I can go back to this adjustment layer because it's not fixed, and I can tweak the color so it blends in a little bit better with the fire, choosing a more orangish yellow to go with it. So there's no end to the flexibility here, and now I can tie my different things together using adjustment layers, using layer blending modes. It's a really easy way to work with it. Now if we go into another picture here, if I were to add another layer, I'm going to just choose a color, something like a nice good green, go with it, get a big squishy brush, and make my brush so it's moderately hard. Now, if I paint on this image here, So I'm painting just the shadow areas very roughly, not worrying too much about detail. Put that in my picture. This mode here, if I were to hit something like multiply, you can see how that color information blends into it, allowing the original material underneath to show through. And if I lower its opacity a little bit, it starts to almost look like I have green colored skin. So there's a lot of options or flexibility built into it. Now if I decide that this is too blotchy and I just want to soften it a little bit, that would be a great opportunity to use a filter, such as a blur. So I could choose like Gaussian blur, which gives a more natural blur than straight blur. And when I choose Gaussian blur, pull it up a little bit and we can see how it starts to 
blur out the color that's there, removing those harsh edges. And now if I wanted to add another layer here and choose a contrasting color, probably should have softened my brush a little bit more, but we can do the same blur and other effect to it. But this is a really easy way to start to add color. So if you say you like to draw, you can do a drawing and then put the drawing down, start using your layers so then you can overlay or screen. So you can start to blend these layers in on your image. And in the end you're only limited really by your imagination of what you can conceive and what you can do with it. Because the tool itself is hugely flexible <coughs> in its abilities to work.